Good morning. I'm happy to be here this morning. I really appreciate everybody joining in today. I'm excited about the content that we have today and this event. Looking forward to the next couple of days of what we get to learn and participate with. And I want to start off today by talking a little bit about online education. To begin with, I want to talk about this picture. And I think for a lot of us right now, when we look at this, it probably invokes a little bit of anxiety. You see large groups of people, there's no mask being worn, and not something that we probably have seen in, in a little while now. I know myself personally, it's been several months uh, since I've been in a crowd uh, this big, and the thought of this right now is not really appealing. With this, I think there also comes kind of, or that this kind of, this piece with COVID has also led us to this issue. And if any, I'm assuming many of you are familiar with this as well. This is my son uh, studying at home. This has been a, a tough experience and not because uh, I think our school districts and, and teachers uh, haven't been trying and, and, and attempting to do their best but because they're being put in a situation that they uh, weren't trained for and they didn't have the experience for. If, you, if this is your experience with e-learning, I understand there's some anxiety and some concern around it. Uh, I will admit that my son and I have had a lot of uh, struggles uh, recently trying to get through things. And, and as we look forward to school coming back on uh, and me continuing my uh, part-time job, unpaid job as a teacher, is something I've been preparing for. Fortunately, in, in my case, however, I've been doing online learning or e-learning since the mid 90s, uh, which makes me really old and means that I've earned the gray hair that I, uh, I have right now. But because of that, I know that there's some tools and some resources that can make e-learning not only uh, less painful, but really, really effective. And so today, if you are looking for kind of some pie in the sky, expression that my grandma used to use or in, in how we're going to deliver this, that's not my intent. My intent is to give you some practical knowledge or resources uh, that you can be looking for as you're thinking about, hey, how do we provide better training in the current situation that we are in, uh, where we want to limit exposure, we want to limit groups, uh, we need to provide uh, training that's ongoing. What are some resources that we have? And I want to sp spend some time talking about those things a little bit and, and work through that. But before we do that, it's important to understand that the world's medical knowledge doubles every 73 days. In a visual sense, that looks something like this. All right? It's almost a, a straight line upward uh, where we're looking at how the world understands uh, what's happening in, in education versus or in, in and understand how medical procedures and practices and, and methodologies versus what an individual knows. In a written term, that looks like this. Now, in addition to this, in kind of a scary way, it's, it's understood that most estimates say that people within uh, six months to a year forget 75 to 98% of what they've learned. So what that does is it creates a situation that looks more like this. We have the world's medical knowledge. We have individual knowledge. And then we have a patient outcome gap. That gap is the, the difference between what the world knows and what, a, what an individual clinician or healthcare provider knows uh, at the time. This then begs the question of, hey, how do we close that gap? And as the general manager at CareerCert, uh, my job has been to focus on this, is how do we enclose that patient outcome gap? How do we improve community health? And I looked to a couple of examples, and one of those uh, most recently uh, has been around the Boston Marathon bombings. This was a, a tragedy and where three people lost their lives uh, and really a, a horrific piece. On the flip side though, uh, we're talking about there are nearly 500,000 people packed along uh, the marathon route and made those streets nearly impassable. The bombs were set off on April 15th 
at the end of the race where there were a bunch of where there were a bunch of people that were packed in there as well, and 281 people uh, were injured in the attacks. As I said, only three people died, and, that, and it's a tragedy for those three people. But it could have been much, much worse. In the review of that uh, event and what happened, it was understood that the frontline emergency specialists and surgeons that were there posted at the location and the proximity of the five level trauma centers located within a few square miles of what was the blast zone uh, contributed to the, uh, the overwhelmingly positive for the situation outcome there. As we look back, uh, the review of those, the congressional review of those uh, pieces came back and said, hey, training and real life exercises is what contributed to saving the lives there. The first responders uh, had been trained and did a great job dealing with the chaos uh, that ensued after uh, the disaster. They built the relationships they needed beforehand, so they knew how to work back and forth. And the city, state, and, emergen and state emergency services planned and prepared for the worst case scenarios. There was a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, a lot of practice, uh, continuous practice and, and preparation that led up to that. Now, again, it was a, a horrible tragedy in, in many ways, but it could have been much worse had it not been for the planning and preparation for that. Now, we think about this as how do we provide training <clears throat> and how can training be modern, efficient, and effective? Uh, we look at it as being continuous, uh, staying current and focus specifically on improving community health. Now for this, uh, we've gone through and, and we like to use a, a rubric, kind of a, an outline of what we're trying to accomplish and keep it to keep us focused in on, on what we're doing. And so we use this kind of nine uh, phase rubric for training in the EMS world. Each one of these has a lot of very specifics and, 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 and plans and guidelines for these things. And I, we're not going to go through all nine. For those of you that were starting to check your email or that had moved on to Instagram, we're not going to do that. I'm going to focus on one of the, the, the pieces that I think <clears throat> oftentimes is what we were referring earlier to my son's training right now, which has not been as, as fantastic as it could be, to some different modalities of training that you may or may not be aware of and how we see them fitting together to provide uh, this training platform. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to cover four different modalities. Now there's more than these four and we only have time for four today because I want to give you kind of a, a guideline from kind of what's the, the most common to some of the more cutting edge pieces. So we're going to talk about self-paced learning, which uh, most of you have seen or are aware of. We'll go for in virtual instructor-led training, uh, scenario-based, and then lastly, I'm going to give you a demo of some VR stuff uh, that's coming, that's out there and, and in use as we go along. So the first one uh, that we're going to talk about here uh, is self-paced. Now, most of you are familiar with self-paced and if you're not, it's kind of the standard. You, you punch the, uh, the space bar. I think a couple of years ago, I had to do some, I had to do a, an online course after getting a speeding ticket to make sure that the points didn't go on my record. Uh, and it really was just punching the space bar uh, until I got to the test and guessed what were the right answers, hoping that I would take as little time as possible. I think I got pretty close. I might have had to go back and do a few in between. That's the traditional self-paced model where you're kind of bouncing through things. And in a lot of cases, that's what uh, the training is. I'm gonna give you some examples where I think this can be so much more than that. The first one uh, being a course that, that we have offered uh, on LGBTQ awareness. Let me show you to that now. All right, here's our course uh, on LGBTQ awareness. I'm gonna go through just a couple pieces of this. And again, this is kind of the basic and, and move, move along, but there's some fundamental pieces that are really important uh, for this course. So first of all, we give an overview of what's in the course. Uh, you can see all these pieces here and there's a checklist to show what the progress is as people come through. I'm gonna start this course quickly. You'll see we have an introduction and you're seeing a lesson one of 24. There's a bunch of things to read through here, uh, but we try to keep it short, minimal scrolling as you come through. Uh, we're going to talk about objectives so people know what they're going to learn. You're telling people what they're going to teach them. You teach them and then you remind them what you taught them, right? 
there's some definitions here. And what we've done here is again, is a little element to try to make this a little bit more interactive so that people have to engage with it uh, before moving on. So you can see that there's a description of each one of these. Uh, they come through and keep uh, the graphics coming through. Come down and continue on. I know I'm going through this a little bit quickly. We have a lot to cover today. <clears throat> I want to get to one last piece here. You can see I've been tracking my progress. We go along and I continue through here. And then there's an interactive piece. Now, a lot of it, I'm just going to kind of throw these together. I haven't read through all these to remember which ones are which, but we'll kind of get the idea. Uh, let's see. So I've matched these up together now. I know that I don't have them all right. I'm going to hit submit because I want to show you. Okay, look, I got a couple of these right, a couple of these wrong. I can go back and redo them as we go along. Again, there should be this interactive component where I'm having to, to engage with the program uh, and keep me motivated as I go through. Now, this is a really basic course. I want to show you another course now uh, offered by by a company called Zenrici, and they develop content for for healthcare, and and this is way better than the textbooks that we've gone through. So let me open that for you now. All right, here is the infectious disease uh, course uh, that Zenrici has uh, created. This is a kind of common subject that, in a lot of cases, when we were in high school or college and having to work through this. Uh, in our textbooks, I admit I probably would have done a lot better if I would have had an experience more like this. And so let me show you this quickly and how this comes through. We're going to start this up and you're going to see the visualization on this is much stronger than anything that, uh, that we're accustomed to. In addition to that, again, there's some interactivity piece uh, as these, as you scroll over and you get some more information and you have to click through to get to the additional pieces uh, of the content we can see that it builds, builds along. Uh, we have to get into the next component here. Again, you're reading through these pieces. And then you've got another bubble here. And before you can move on, see this is not yet uh, enabling us to go, we need to click through. Every organism is composed of one of two structurally different types of cells with distinction made based on the internal structure of each. A prokaryote lacks a true membrane bound nucleus and lacks complex organelles. A eukaryote has a true nucleus that is bound by a nuclear envelope and contains complex organelles. Great. So you can see how we moved through that video. There's additional information that's here. This is an example of uh, these typical screen-based courses where the user or the learner is guiding their, their pathway through this. They're, they can do it at their time and at their speed. Next, I want to go and show you a virtual classroom. With a virtual instructor-led classroom, it's like a classroom only online, which makes sense, right? Uh, in this case, we have an instructor. Uh, we have students that are there. This is typically used when subject matter is a little bit more complex, when it requires some interaction, some questions, some follow-up, when the learning is done with uh, communication through uh, the student. Now, we have a great example of this that I want to show. Now, this is from our own library. I've tried to get a mix of companies and, and offerings out there to, to, to show you. Uh, this one's from our own library. I took a recording of one of our uh, great instructors, Richard. This is, he's interacting with our students as they go through, just to give you an idea of what, what this environment looks like. Let me show that to you right now. All right. Here is the virtual instructor-led course uh, taught by Richard. We're going to pick up with him uh, teaching his classroom. You can see we're starting on compressions. Uh, we've got the people participating in the class here. We've got the chat section going on the right-hand side. You're going to see Richard talk about uh, the content as well as interact with students who go along here. We'll listen in for a little bit. Wait. At least a hundred compressions a minute. We have to have a hundred compressions a minute, but no more than 120. Why did we put that cap on? If you guys remember, prior to 2015, it just said greater than 100. 
But in 2015, we changed that. We changed it to 100 to 120 because we had to have this. We found out through a variety of studies in the UK and in Europe that if we didn't, we didn't have refill. All right, Daniel? If we go too fast, we could not refill those ventricles and we'd be compressing an empty ventricle and nothing would go out. How many of you have had this? How many of you had um, a bystander, a law enforcement officer, a firefighter, a new medic, an intern, somebody helping you do compressions? How often do you have to tell them to speed up as compared to how often do you have to tell them to slow down? I found it's usually about nine to one. <laughs> Nine times I'm telling them, slow it down. Yeah, we want to be right at 110. So how do we maintain this correct rate? And you guys are either going to love me or hate me in just like 10 seconds. What's, one of the, what's a great way to do it? Absolutely positive way to do it. Play a song in your head, right? Matthew, what's the song? Staying Alive is a great one. What's one you can't use? Another one bites the dust. No, Daniel, no, no, no. And if you do do that one, make sure that you aren't doing it out loud. What's the new great one to use? Perfect, perfect, 110 beats per minute. Who in here has little kids? Who's got little kids? Baby shark, do 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 baby shark, do 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 baby shark is just perfect. All right, I will stop it there. And for those of you that won't get that song out of your head for the rest of the day, I apologize. Let's talk about the next one. Now, scenarios-based courses uh, are the best way I can describe them to people who maybe haven't seen them before is it's a little bit like the choose your own adventure books uh, that we had when we were kids, uh, where you would read through a chapter and then it would say, hey, if you wanna skip, or if you, if you choose scenario A, then you skip forward to page 157. This is similar to that in a lot of ways. Uh, so we're gonna join this uh, scenario partway through. Uh, I want you to notice the interactivity. Uh, I want you to notice having to think through this a little bit, and we'll give you a couple examples as we uh, move through. All right. This is a course on blunt chest trauma created by 911 e-learning out of uh, South Carolina. These guys do a great job and this is used with permission. And I wanna walk you through uh, this, uh, this course. In reality, it's gonna walk me through more of this course. Uh, so let me, uh, let me get started right here. All right, so the course is starting to, to talk us through uh, the scenario. We see the, the content matching uh, what we're seeing on screen. keep moving through this. It's kind of setting up the scenario, right? So we're aware of what's what's happening and you'll see how this builds up uh, as we go down. All right. I like Sandra here. As right, so you can see, it's personalized a little bit, <clears throat> calling me and calling me out uh, to make sure that I'm paying attention. <laughs> it tells me to listen up specifically. So I'm getting some instruction. Keep moving through. I'm trying to set the stage a little bit for what the, what the experience is gonna be like. What's, what's the scenario that I'm walking into?
Alessandra's inclusive look here. Okay, now we come to the part where the course is uh, starting to engage us and that we need to interact with. Uh, the way to think about this uh, in these cases is kind of like if you remember when we were kids, uh, you had your choose your own adventure books. You would read the first chapter or two and then it would say, hey, if you think that, uh, that Jane and, and Cindy uh, should go inside the haunted house, then move to page 57. If you think they should go back home and play uh, with their dog, then move to page 128. Uh, that's kind of what's happening here is you're starting to interact with it and you get to choose and select what, uh, what the best course of action is. So we're going to do that as we move through. And this first question is, uh, it could be in critical condition. I don't know. It's possible, right? So let's, let's go through and see. Uh, Sandra is very distressed here, obviously, uh, but we're getting the point. Um, <clears throat> one thing I want to highlight here is that this, I've been interacting using my mouse on a keyboard, uh, but you can also use this on a desktop or a tablet, and so just swiping uh, will allow you to, to move throughout the, the scenario. That means that this could be used for somebody who's on duty but maybe not actively working if they are sitting in a truck someplace or if they are back at the station and, and have some time there that they can go through these. They're purposely built to take anywhere from eight to, to 12 to 15 minutes, and so they can be done uh, regularly. In addition, they are, are updated regularly, right? So new information that comes down uh, can be created and, and available as opposed to waiting every two years when information becomes old or obsolete oftentimes, all right? So we're gonna keep moving through this uh, and see what happens. So we're coming up on the, the incident now, and we're starting to get some information about what's happening. I'm assuming that most of you in the audience uh, are familiar with this situation. You're starting to formulate in your head or, or relate to what's happening and thinking, hey, what would I be doing? What would be happening here? That's exactly what the course is intended to do. So now we come up and you're thinking, yep, we've got to get to an assessment. Well, we've got a, a several different options here that we can go through uh, as well as checking things out. First of all, uh, let's check surroundings and see what it says. All right, so we get an idea of, okay, we're starting to build uh, the scenario in our heads. Uh, let's look at the history. You can imagine Frank uh, replying back to us and what he's saying. You're starting to think about this a little bit. Let's do a physical exam. Now, obviously, uh, this isn't taking the place of the actual physical exam practice uh, that would need to happen. Uh, but it does start to get you thinking about, hey, what am I, what should I be doing, right? Now Sandra comes in and we've got a pronounced JBD. Yeah, it's just as an example, we can click through on this and get a picture of what that might look like, what we should expect to see, right? Whereas in a classroom, that might not always be the case. All right, we're gonna check and monitor now, right? Oh, well, the monitor's still in the ambulance. Uh, we didn't grab that out, but we can start to pull off. Okay, so now we're starting to paint the picture a little bit closer for us, where our respiratory rate is. Airways. Let's check his heart. All right, by now, most everybody's starting to understand okay, what we've got going on here, right? What's the, what's the scenario? And finally, right? Okay, so we're gonna continue through here. Now that we've done the assessment, looked around, Sandra very inquisitively, uh, what do you think that general impression of patients? Now, I know that most of the people listening in immediately said, hey, critical, let's get this, uh, let's go immediately transport this person. Just because sometimes in school I was a little bit of a contrarian, we're gonna say stable just to see what happens. <laughs> and I get the, the massive look of disappointment. I swear my 16 year old gave me this look this morning. Uh, so I am well, well versed in this. I don't know how this is supposed to be. I need to think about this apparently. 
And now it's going to teach me, look, if you're not thinking about this, uh, and Gabe, who's been one of our instructors is walking me through this. Um, clearly this is a, a critical patient and we're going to get some, some updated information. Hey, this is what you need to do in this case. All right. So now we get the chance to try again. Let's say critical this time. And I get a smiley face this time, which I don't get from a 16 year old, even when I am right. I uh, definitely critical. And so we're going to take care of this. And so you would continue through this scenario. So here's a good example of a, of a really well done scenario based course. All right. Now let's go back. All right. Now I want to talk to you about and show you some examples of virtual reality training. Uh, this is very different from uh, what we've been doing up to until now. Uh, this was used uh, with permission or being used with permission uh, and developed by Health Scholars, which is a company out of Colorado. They've done a fantastic job here. Uh, this brings an entirely new uh, element to training. Now, in this case, I couldn't pre-send everybody here on, in, this, uh, in this discussion uh, via our headsets for you to track this. So what we've done is we've taken a 2D version of this and a recording of it. And so what I need you to do is use your imaginations a little bit and if you haven't used VR before, uh, then you kind of put a headset on it and it makes it look and feel like you're in the environment and you interact with the environment. If you have, then imagine using this in that, in that case uh, with your headset on and how you're interacting with this. As you do this, you'll, you will have seen that up until this point, I've highlighted that I've had to use my keyboard and my mouse to interact uh, with the training components. In this case, uh, we're going to use our voice. And so you speak uh, like you would, and we're going to go through an ACLS training piece as we go through. You'll see the scenario we're going to walk into, and there's a, a, a gentleman on the floor. Uh, we've responded. Uh, we're part of the response team. Uh, and we're going to walk through what would be the responses we go through. So for the sake of this, suspend reality looking at the, at the screen and, and imagine that you're immersed in this situation and then let's go through and do that now welcome to the acls pre-hospital vr simulation my name is michael i'm here to introduce you to the app and i'll be observing and helping during this simulation you will be in the role of team lead during both non-cardiac arrest and cardiac arrest scenarios i know you're pretty new to this app Let's take a minute to get you used to working in the VR environment. Because it's important to optimize the space for patient care, let's learn about talking in VR while optimizing the room. First, it's kind of dark in here. Ask Aaron to turn on the lights. Aaron, please turn on the lights. Sure, I'll get the lights. That's it. I think we're about ready. Mr. Nelson is a 65-year-old man. We received a call that he was dizzy and laid down here. We hooked him up to the biphasic defibrillator and have a bolus of normal saline going. You can see his rhythm, and he has a pulse. How should we treat this? Aaron, let's administer adenosine. I'll administer adenosine. Please restate the instruction and include the dosage I should give. Okay, uh, Aaron, let's give him six milligrams of adenosine. Giving adenosine six milligrams. Whoa. All right, the adenosine is in. All right, looks like that didn't work. Uh, Aaron, let's give him 12 milligrams of adenosine. Giving adenosine 12 milligrams. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Hmm, blood pressure is still holding and his pulse is strong. Should we give atropine? Sir, how are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. Actually, I don't feel bad at all. No, we don't need to give any atropine. Oh, right. With stable bradycardia, we should hold off on meds and just observe in a monitored setting while working up the underlying causes. Good call. He's very hypotensive. How should we manage this? What's your name? My name is Sonia. 
Okay, Sonia, let's do synchronized cardio version at 200 joules. Performing synchronized cardio version. Charging. All clear. Shock delivered. Is BP normalized? How should we treat this? Aaron, let's give him 150 milligrams of amiodarone. Giving amiodarone 150 milligrams IV. His color still looks good. Can you tell us what rhythm this is? This looks like a type one second degree AV block. Right, type one second degree AV block, also called Wankybach. Since he's asymptomatic, we do not need to intervene emergently. His care team can work up the cause after the procedure. However, if he becomes unstable, we'll give atropine and move to transcutaneous pacing if that doesn't work. He's still bradycardic and hypotensive. Please let us know what this rhythm is before we proceed. Uh, that looks like it's a type 2 third degree AV block. It is a type of AV block, but that's not the right one. Which one is it? That looks like Mobitz. Right, I see. It's type 2, also called Mobitz, second degree AV block. It's highly unstable. The waveform just changed and he's more hypotensive. Normal saline and O2 are going. What should we do? Uh, let's check for H's and T's. That's a great idea. Because we're drilling ACLS protocols, we just want to concentrate on the algorithms. Okay. Let's do transcutaneous pacing going. Please use the name of the person you're talking to. Okay. Initiating transcutaneous pacing at 70 milliamps and a rate of 70. We have good capture. He's still hypotensive. What should we do? Sonia, let's start synchronized cardio version at 140 joules. Performing synchronized cardio version. Charging. All clear. Shock delivered. Vitals are unchanged. All right, from that you can see it's a completely different experience than maybe you've ever done with online uh, learning before. The first time I did this, unfortunately I was sitting down, uh, I, you start to develop a little bit of anxiety and I was a little surprised about how real it felt and how I was really paying attention to, hey, I've got to take care of, uh, and I'm in charge and responsible for what needs to happen here. As I've watched other specifically clinicians do this, I've noticed over and over again how they have lost their sense of the, 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 the space around them and really focused in and concentrated. And when they've um, mistaken something, they've got it wrong, they've, I've heard them speak to themselves and say, oh, I need to get that right. I need, I need to go back. Let's go back. And they're talking themselves through the, the scenario. Oftentimes that doesn't happen in a real life scenario because people want to look like they've get, they get this right or that they know what, what's happening. Uh, and so it creates an environment on something that we don't always get a ton of practice on, uh, but we need to be kept up uh, to date on our skills on. So the virtual reality component uh, is really helpful on this. Now, we are about out of time. Uh, so I'm gonna bring this back to the rubric here. We talked today about four different modalities. There are several more modalities. I just wanna give you an example of what's possible out there from uh, the screen-based to the virtual classroom uh, to scenario to VR. Uh, if we were to go into any one of these nine different uh, components to the rubric, we could, and there's uh, equal amounts of information and, and data that comes through that that we can provide or that can be provided and you can be going through. But we wanted to provide you with uh, this rubric. Now, we're happy to send this to, to anybody who wants it. Uh, we'll get that out. Uh, to give you an idea of what's available there. I really wanted to thank you for your time today. Really appreciate 
the attention. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, really grateful for the opportunity to speak at this. I know it's a new environment and, uh, and event for everybody. Uh, looking forward to the next couple of days and thank you very much.